When James Watson and Francis Crick, working with Morris Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin, unraveled the double helix structure of DNA in 1953, little did they know that their work had laid the foundation for a new age of molecular biology and ultimately the sequencing of the complete set of DNA within a human, the human genome. Many more researchers contributed to this journey, adding knowledge around how genes are inherited and their roles in different organisms. In 1977, Fred Sanger and his colleagues developed a process called sequencing to actually read sections of DNA, identifying the precise four chemical codes of specific genes. Through the 1980s, this new sequencing technology was used to reveal the genomes of small organisms, such as yeasts and nematode worms, honing and refining experimental approaches. In 1990, there was a significant scaling up in both ambition and organism size when plans to sequence an entire human genome were launched. Today at Hinkston on the outskirts of Cambridge, a group of scientists are engaged on a project of such significance it's been described as the biological equivalent of landing on the moon or splitting the atom. The Human Genome Project was a global collaboration with the UK arm funded by Wellcome and led by Sir John Sulston. It was John Sulston himself who discovered the former Tube Investments Research Laboratory site in Hinkston. It was in these buildings that a new team was recruited to form the core of what was then known as the Sanger Centre. This eventually developed into the Wellcome Sanger Institute and by the time the project was completed in 2003, the Institute had generated around 30% of the total DNA sequence of the human genome. Actually, at the time, we probably didn't realise how big a project it was going to be, sure. and probably the sort of foundations of what we have now, hmm. which is quite staggering, really. It's not been bad 25 years, has it, really? No, it's, it's been really good. Hopefully more to come. <laughs> <laughs> My first involvement with the Human Genome Project actually went back to an aspiration when I was in my previous role. I and I think a lot of other people had heard about the Sanger Centre and, and really had, had, had a desire to, to want to work there. The reason for that is because we'd heard about this incredibly ambitious, possibly impossible project that was being undertaken and everyone that I knew wanted to be part of it. When we came in April of 1993, we were actually working on the yeast genome sequencing project, which we've been doing at the Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. And the work on the Human Genome Project was founded on the yeast and the worm sequencing, which was the other two teams that were here on the site. Nancy and I came together in, mm. in April of that year. Yep. Yes, I was 18, got long out of school and just trying to decide whether to go to university or not, but we came and worked here, so um, Carol was my first boss and it we had a really nice family feel here. Yeah, it was really small and everyone seemed to know everybody else if not very well, I mean, you knew who everybody was and, and what they were working on. Yeah, and you joined just after, didn't you? Sam? I joined in November of 93. Yeah. Um, Carol, you weren't my boss at the no, time. I wasn't. <laughs> no, I wasn't. Sharon was, and um, yeah, it was, it was, it was the, it was the family feel that made it special. I was 18 as well, straight out of school, and then my first job, and um, it was brilliant. <laughs> I didn't start right at the beginning. I joined in September 94. It was still a very small team, certainly compared to today. Everybody that I met was really open, helpful, welcoming. John Salston was very, well, fun and engaging and encouraging and um, would stop and talk to, to absolutely anybody. And that, that was a real change because I'd worked in a couple of other research organisations which seemed to be much more hierarchical where you, you had to sort of almost bow and scrape to the, to the professor or the, pe the people in charge. It just had a family feel, it was amazing uh, and because of the design of the building, even though it was a really old building, it was essentially a square so you could walk around and you'd always be bumping into people, always be talking. People were really friendly, that's one of the first things that I kind of noticed when I first started working here. They'd always talk to you and even though they're kind of really clever, a number of them really clever scientists, experts in their fields. They had no problem in kind of sharing their science with you. So we called it the fishbowl because it, all the people at the top used to look over and sort of see us down. Yeah. Yes, 
Yeah, and I remember the fishbowl quite a lot because we'd often get a lot of visitors come. I hadn't been here that long um, when we moved over to uh, Hinkston. And uh, John Tolston came in the lab with Bart Burrell and, and he brought in um, Fred Sanger and we had Watson and Crick and Max Peruse and they all came in and I was busy in the lab with my headphones on singing away. And then we just had lots of partitions and so all the equipment was just in little areas and you'd just walk around and go to the next one. And the sequences were there as well so you'd be prepping something and then you'd go around load of sequence. And, but you could hear everything, you could talk to everyone and wave at the <laughs> people upstairs. Yeah. Um, it, it was quite a strange place. We used to yeah. celebrate people doing like one contig of work and we'd be like, well done, you've done that, it took you a month, that's brilliant. Yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah. And as, yeah. as time went on, it'd be like, you'd be, you'd be able to do like um, 20 of those in a month. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then obviously time went on and on. So yeah, celebrations now are for very big yeah. milestones, but they were quite small milestones in those days, but they were, they seemed big at the time, yeah. At they the time, were, we were just were, like, that's yeah. amazing, we're the first people yeah. to have done that. <laughs> I can remember when the draft of the human genome was published, John Salston himself said, this is just the, the beginning, it's, it's not the end point, this is the beginning of a huge amount of research because we have to work out what all of this data means, what, what does the sequence mean? The discovery of the sequence, the code of life, is only the beginning. It's very important to realise that it's, it's not the end of the process, it's only the end of the beginning. I think that this is certainly laying the foundations of a new biology of, and, and of new medical science. When they finally completed the draft of the Human Genome Project, um, they gave everyone on site who was involved um, some memorabilia to take with them. Now, I've got a couple of items with me here. One is this T-shirt which kind of marks the, the occasion through our human genome. But they printed all of the names of everybody on site at that time. So I'm here, I'm here somewhere, um, which was a really, really nice touch. So I've, I've kept that, I haven't worn it. One of the, the core principles was open sharing of, of the data. That really came into its own when, when it, it, it felt as though we'd, we'd entered a bit of a race to, towards the end because there was competition from the project that was being led by Craig Venter. And the ambition of that project was to privatise the, the genome, to benefit financially from it, to charge people to access. And so more effort was put into our side of the project to enable the ability to submit and complete the genome first so that it could be shared publicly for, for anybody to, to use. That core principle was established by John Salston and, and others. All of this should be in the public domain. It should not be something which is, is, is essentially based in profit making. Profit making may come into it for particular applications, but overall I think we need a public social welfare attitude to the use of this information. And I believe that we have to drive medicine forward in this way. And it's absolutely carried through as a golden thread, really through all of the years that I've certainly been working here. It's always been a principle that data, information, good practice, publications are shared with anybody so that all researchers around the world and you know, others can benefit from the work that is done here. We can reflect on the fact that it took us 10 years and, and billions, of, billions of dollars to sequence the first human genome and hundreds of people globally. Nowadays, with the next generation sequencing technology, it costs a few hundred dollars and, and human genomes, several thousand human genomes are sequenced here every week. Three more people have tested positive in the UK for coronavirus, with Northern Ireland confirming its first case tonight. A ninth person has tested positive for coronavirus in the UK. In 2020, as the COVID-19 pandemic took hold across the world, the Sanger Institute became a key member of the newly formed COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium, or COG UK. As part of COG UK, the Institute has adapted its DNA sequencing pipelines to undertake large-scale, rapid, whole genome sequencing of SARS-CoV-2, the virus responsible for the pandemic. 
demonstrating the ambition and innovation which also underpinned the Human Genome Project, the Institute has generated over 500,000 viral genome sequences, with more being produced every day. This data is freely available to researchers and healthcare professionals across the globe and has been used to understand viral transmission and evolution and to inform public health responses and vaccine development. You look at the site now, it's massive. It's completely changed from when I started to where it is now. And I think the historical aspect of what actually happened here and what was done has laid that foundation for where the campus is now and where it's going to go in the future. And I think it's really important that we remember those things and the people that gave their time. Um, it wasn't about earning a wage, it was always about advancing the science and making a difference.